We will call the uh, March 21st, 2024 meeting of the Pinellas County Charter Review Commission to order. My name is Brian Angst. I was appointed by uh, Commissioner Chris Lavala, and I serve as the chairman. Uh, Ms. Commissioner Eggers, if you want to introduce yeah, yourself, uh, starting I'm with Dave Eggers, right. and I'm uh, representing the Board of County Commissioners. Wade Vos, General Counsel for the Charter Review Commission. Senator Nick DeSegli, Pinellas Delegation Appointee. Doug Thomas, Facilitator. Ricky Butler, Commissioner Peters Appointee. Mark Strickland, Commissioner Long Appointee. Mike Twitty, Constitutional Officers Appointee. Okay, and I see we have two CRC members uh, online. Uh, we have our Vice Chair, Dr. Grove, and Commissioner Tom Steck. I don't know if you guys wanna unmute and introduce just to test that out, um, or if not, that's no problem, but. I'm Tom Steck, uh, Charlie Justice Commissioner Appointee. Very good, we heard you, Commissioner Steck and Dr. Grove. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Grove. Um, I'm a, I was appointed uh, public at large. Fantastic. Okay, very good. Um, all right, so we did the roll call. It is now time for public comment on items that are not on the agenda. And I don't see any members of the public here. And I don't see any members of the public online. Although if... Uh, Chair, there is somebody online. Okay. Mr. Uh, Brett, Brett S., if you would like to make a comment, if you could raise your hand in Zoom and we will unmute you and you will have three minutes to comment. If you do not want to make a comment, you do not have to make a comment. Do we have any indication of whether Brett will make a comment? Okay, that's no problem. Um, all right, moving on to approval of the January 22nd, 2024 meeting minutes. Has everyone had a chance to review the minutes? Any corrections, revisions? Mr. Chair, I make a motion to approve. We have a motion from Commissioner Butler. Second. Second, and all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Chairman? Um, yes, sir. One other one we did send out, we didn't have until later uh, last week, but we did re or sent out the minutes from the um, February 26th meeting as well. If everyone didn't get a chance to review them, we can put them on at the next meeting. Yeah, let's do them the next, let's do it the next meeting. Okay. Um, that won't be a problem. Gotcha, thank you. Um, okay, uh, new business, term limits for county commissioners. Um, we know that there had been some legislative uh, efforts in that regard, and I think the commission, our commission uh, wanted to see how that played out before we address the issue. My understanding, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Thomas and, and Attorney Vose, my understanding is that there was no legislation that was enacted regarding uh, county commission term limits, so the ball is back into our court uh, as it relates to the Pinellas County Charter. Um, Mr. Vose, Mr. Thomas, if you'd like to take us from here. That's, yeah, certainly, and uh, certainly we have uh, uh, one of our, your state senator here as well, so maybe you would want to chime in on this, but uh, a lot of actions throughout the session. We've tried to keep you updated as it was working through committee and the process. At the end of the day, it did not go before the Senate, um, and so it died, and uh, as a result, it's something that generated a lot of interest here. Uh, by the CRC, and we were just kind of waiting, as you said, to find out if there was going to be state action, and if so, how to react to it. So we thought it would be helpful uh, when Wade, you and I had discussed to prepare for this meeting, that it'd be appropriate to maybe start that conversation this evening, so we had some direction about where the CRC may want to go, uh, and whatever the terms that they may be proposing, or just to give us some direction so we can start to frame the issues for your discussions. Um, Mr. Rose, did you have anything to add to that? No, I believe Doug uh, handled it well. Included in the agenda packet is a chart that was derived from the Florida Association of Counties chart uh, among the 20 charter counties, uh, listing out a bunch of different information concerning uh, the legislative bodies for the 20 charter counties. One of the columns on there is uh, the term limits uh, provisions within those charters. Uh, as you'll see, a number of uh, charter counties do not have term limits. Uh, however, a, a good number of charter counties do have term limits. They vary from uh, two terms or eight years to three terms or 12 years. I was so, gonna ask about Polk County. So under term limitation, 
when I see two, that means two four-year terms, or if I see, like for Brevard, or if I see three under Broward, that means three four-year terms. But when I get to Polk, it says 12. Yeah. So I'm assuming that means 12 years? I think that's a tie. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not so many limitations on that. <laughs> that that's correct. Yeah, tw that with regard to Polk, uh, 12 is 12 years. Okay, got it. Okay. And so just it would wanted be three to make sure terms. I was, uh, that was my assumption. Just want to make sure I was reading it correctly. Okay, so... Um, you know, term limits, I think, is a, a relatively straightforward concept, but there are several things to think about, and this is supposed to be a generative discussion and to provide feedback to Doug and, and Wade about where we want to go and what they should be drafting. And the goal that I would have tonight is to give them clear enough direction from at least a consensus or a majority of us to get them drafting something or two proposals, I really don't want them drafting four or five proposals, you know, maybe one or two, kind of like what, what they did with the county attorney um, uh, termination and, and hiring process. So when I think about term limits, I think about uh, how many terms are there going to be. If you're going to put term limits, I think two terms or three terms at the most would, otherwise, why would you have term limits? When I think about term limits, I also think about is there a cooling off, off period? So uh, I'm familiar with the city of Clearwater. The city of Clearwater set term limits for, for many years, uh, going back to the 1990s when this issue became a, a, a kind of public issue and a very political issue here in the county. And in Clearwater, you have to sit out a full term. Uh, if you're on the city council and you serve eight years, you can run for mayor, but you cannot run for city council. If you, uh, and if you're mayor and you serve eight years, you have to sit out four years before you can be on the council again, um, or before you can be mayor again. In Hillsborough County, you can go directly from eight years as a district uh, county commissioner and run for a at-large seat. So Hillsborough is different in that you can go directly, you can essentially have 16 years if you get elected to a different seat that's an at-large at seat. And in Pinellas County, we do have district commissioners uh, like Commissioner Eggers and Commissioner Latvala, and we do have at-large commissioners uh, like Commissioner Long. Um, and so that, is an, that would be an important question for us to start thinking about uh, and to start discussing uh, if we're going to do term limits, uh, how many terms, and are, is there a cooling off period, and are you allowed to run from a district seat to an at-large seat? Um, those were the thoughts that popped into my mind. Um, I don't know who wants to dive into this topic. I know Commissioner Eggers, you all have already discussed this um, at the County Commission in the past and you'd proposed uh, 12 years at one point. I don't know if you kind of want to, as the commission representative, lead us in that, in that discussion. Well, yeah, at the last, at the last CRC, I, I was pushing for term limits and um, it, wasn't, it wasn't even discussed. So which I was, I'm really proud of this group that at least we're going to have the discussion and, and that's a good thing. Um, and for, for me, now I'm, I'm serving in my third term. I, I, I believe that three terms is the right amount for a county commissioner. There's just a, an awful lot of breadth and depth of issues and, 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 and things that we, that we deal with. And I think that first term is pretty much a learning. It doesn't mean you can't make a difference in the first term, but I think 12 years is the right number. And because it's 12 years, I think the cooling off period should be four years. Because what I think in this, just as an example, we have somebody that's running for county commission that started in January of last year. So they're effectively running 20, they, you could get out and then start running a campaign immediately for the next, for the open, for the, for the for, for, I guess you could run for the, the, the companion seat. Uh, if you're a district, you could run for at large. Um, I think four years, if, you, if you're going to serve 12 years, I think a four-year cooling off period is, is the right thing to do. And the only other thing that I'd, that I'd throw in there to just think about, and I'm not sure how it comes into play, is um, an effective date so that we know, like you say, you say January 1st of 2025, whatever, you know, however many terms you have at that point, plus one more, unless you haven't hit three terms or whatever that we come up with. So there's some language yeah. that we have to deal with on that front to, to kind of have that starting, that point of, of reference right. as to what you have in terms of the ter uh, terms. Um, and, and it really just deals with the current sitting commission almost and transition for those folks. So. Um, that's, those are the only things I would add to that Thank conversation. You, sir. And, and that was a huge point that I missed was, is it retroactive? or not, 
and when does it become effective? Um, does it become effective when it's voted on in November 2024 and the commissioners that are up for election this time take their seats sub, you know, pursuant to whatever the term limit is? Does it become effective in 2026? Um, and does it apply retroactively to to persons that have already been elected, or does it not? Does it start over? You know, and you know, my preference would be not to make it retroactive because I think our commissioners have run for office and been elected under the current system. But I mean, it's up to y'all. You know, what direction we want to give. But my point being, at the beginning, term limit seems like a relatively straightforward topic, but there are a lot of these nuances that we got to dig into, and, um, and hopefully other, we'll hear more about that. Yes, one other nuance was the. Um, we have uh, a commissioner who has served at least one, I don't know if it's two, a partial term. So we want to make sure that, you know, does that count as a full term? And, and our thought process, again, I just want to make sure that, that we address that, yeah. that only other issue. That's that a I great point. Of. President of the United States, the term limit's actually 10 years because if you become president uh, less than halfway through the term of your, if you become, if you're the vice president, you become president less than halfway through the term, you get to serve two full terms. So. Um, that's an interesting topic because Commissioner Latvala is serving a partial term, I believe, right? Right. He'll be. He's he, up again in 24. Years, and he'll yeah. Be, yeah. Running again. That's a very interesting point. So we have a lot of nuances for you, uh, Turdy Vos. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and for, fortunately, I had uh, I had been following the various drafts uh, that came out of the legislature in the House and the Senate, which actually dug into the nuances of these issues a lot more than the uh, a lot of the other county charter. Uh, provisions in other counties do, uh, digging into uh, the matter of partial terms and, and cooling off periods in particular. There was language in, I think, both the House and the Senate by the end with uh, cooling off periods and so on. So we've got, we've got good tools to work with to look back at that language to piece some of this together. Um, one thing to, to point out, and Chairman, you uh, address it there with regard to whether or not you would make uh, it just prospective or retrospective uh, and so on. Um, I will share with you generally there's, I have never seen any uh, discussion of any legal concern or issue of having a, a term limit be imposed kind of coextensively with somebody being elected at this November election. The idea being if you're on the ballot, you know that's on the ballot, you're taking a risk that you know, when you get elected, you might be subject to, to that rule and so on. There has not been any direct litigation in Florida with regard to whether or not retroactive or retrospective term limits uh, pose any sort of due process problems or anything like this. I can give you at least one example of a city in South Florida where there was a retroactive term limits provision and it was not challenged on that basis, it was challenged on others and it was upheld. So for whatever reason, folks either didn't challenge it as being retroactive or it otherwise survived at the trial court and wasn't mentioned at the appellate court. But you've got a full menu of options uh, before you to make those decisions. So who wants, to, who wants to go on the record? Yes, Commissioner. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Can we get a quick poll, poll of those that are interested in term limits? Just to Good kick point. this off. Yeah, there may be some of us who don't want term limits at all, and that's an option, which is the current the current system. So uh, I guess the question being, if you are interested in proposing a term limit question in general, please raise your hand. You said you do want yes yeah. to proposing one. Okay, if you are not interested in term limits, please raise your hand. So I think that was what seven to four. Yeah. Did I do that math? There's right? four. No, I mean four, four knows. Four. Yeah. Seven. Yeah, seven to four. Okay. So the discussion will continue. Um, all right. Now that we are talking about proposing a term limit, who wants to take the lead on the various nuances that we we have outlined? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, uh, um, I, I'm, I work very closely with. Uh, Senator Angoli, who was the bill sponsor of the uh, attempt to deal with term limits for county commissioners in the legislature, he's one of my roommates. Uh, he put a lot of time and effort into uh, getting feedback uh, from, you know, from local governments, from various uh, counties in the state. Obviously, you know, uh, Wade mentioned, you know, I think the, uh, a lot of thought went into that. So, you know, my position, number one, I think uh, this should be prospective. 
Uh, I support eight years. Uh, I believe that the cooling off period should be two years. Uh, and then the effective um, date essentially would be, uh, say, November of 2026. And so if there, if there was, say, for example, I guess a county commissioner who um, up to that point had served at least that eight years, then that would then re reset that. So it's very similar to uh, what was proposed in, uh, in the legislature. Um, so that's uh, certainly where, where my starting point is. Okay. Uh, yes, Commissioner Eggers. Just a question. <clears throat> Are you saying that um, at the 2026, if they've already served two terms, and, it, mm -hmm. and, and we go with the, what you suggested, that they'll have two more terms to serve? Prospective, or, you said. Pr prospective, or, or, or are they finished at, at the end of that next term? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Um, if, since it would be prospective, I would assume that it's gonna be starting in, in 2026. So 2026, you'd be starting from Right. Now, I think, I think that the question and, and the conversation we're going to have to have here is, is, that, is that something that we want to move forward with? Because, you know, at that point, you know, we're going to have several, um, obviously in this county, several folks who have served, you know, longer than that, that eight years. And so I think that that's going to be a, a big part of this, this conversation, how, how we handle that. Yeah. I, I wouldn't want to be too generous with extensions. If we did three terms and you were coming to the end of that, then you're talking about a fresh three terms. Yes, yeah, I, that's I, just, I agree with that's you. That's just now we're up to six. That's a, that's being very generous to transition. I agree. <laughs> so, yeah, I agree. Anyway. So, so to recap, um, what Senator DeSigli suggested, uh, just to make sure I'm clear and make sure we're all on the same page, it would be uh, two four-year terms or eight years maximum. Uh, the effective date would be 2026, um, and the there would be a two-year cooling off period uh for those commissioners elected from 2026 going forward after they served eight years before they could serve on the commission again and i assume senator disagree that means that you would not want them to be able to jump after eight years from a district seat to an at-large seat yeah because I, I think what what you see in hillsborough county i mean it's essentially yeah you, you if you time it just right an individual could not have term limit they just keep, keep that going. keep it the rotation going over and over and over again. Right, okay. Uh, who else would like to opine or give us the, the benefit of your thoughts on this topic? Yes, Commissioner Overeem. I forgot how the microphone works. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would support the majority of what Senator DeSegli just brought up. Um, and I would need clarification if it was starting in 26, would every commissioner be up? At the same time, that would make me a little uncomfortable. And I would prefer uh, that we start with three four-year terms, totaling 12 years with a four-year cooling off period. I agree with Senator Segley. I think that not having the cooling off period kind of violates the spirit of term limits. So uh, to Commissioner Egger's point, I think the county is vast and it takes many years to get up to speed on everything under your purview. Sometimes you're not sitting as a commissioner, you're sitting as the EMS Advisory Council and you know a number of other different technical areas that require in-depth knowledge. So my preference would be to start with three four-year terms. And uh, at one point, the House bill, I think, had um, an amendment to go to 12 years instead of eight in the legislature. So I think that if we if we get 12 years done and people like that here, uh, there's a possibility that the state comes back and I, I think this has come up for several years in a row if I'm not mistaken. So, um, and then we could be preempted and go to eight years. So I think that a lot of the conversations I've had in the community are where people are comfortable starting with 12 years. And so personally I'm in agreement and that's where I would like to start. Okay, um, and that was a great point. Uh, the legislature could undo anything that we do anyway, and it seems like they're interested in this topic. So um, that is something to keep in mind, that whatever we propose, even if it passes, is always gonna be subject to preemption um, by the legislature, uh, including whether, when it's effective, whether it's retroactive or not. I mean, all of that um, would ultimately uh, be up to them if they do, um, if they do pass something on this. Uh, yes, Commissioner Eggers. Uh, and maybe Nick can answer. Uh, um, I thought there was uh, there was something in there that said if you don't have term limits as of 
a certain date, then was that July 1, then, then you must have term limits? Does that, did that, or did it say you must have eight years? Like if, if we already had term limits, would that have applied to us? If we already had 12 years as a, that's what my concern was this past year, that they were gonna say, well, if you have them already, you're good to go. But if you don't, then you're going to have eight years. What was the, what was the, um, thing? yeah, that's a good question. There was a lot of amendments towards the end. Um, uh, I, I, what I think what, what had happened was eight years. That, that was, that was the starting point. And then obviously there were some counties that have 12 years. Uh, I think the thought was that those counties that have 12 years, uh, Senator Angolia wanted to give the, the voters in, in that particular county an opportunity to vote whether or not they wanted to okay. keep the 12 or go down to eight. Okay. Um, but then obviously the bill died, so. Okay. Okay. But, but, I, but I could tell you, Mr. Chairman, you're correct. I think this is an issue that's gonna come Keep up back. Uh, probably every legislative session. I think eight from, and this is kind of, this is obviously, you know, my perspective as well. I think the number eight years is something that you know, we, we are, are bound to in, in the legislature, the governor, the governor's cabinet, um, you know, it's a number that, that seems to work. Uh, and I understand the, the 12 years, I get that. Uh, but from a legislative standpoint, I think that we're gonna continue seeing that, that, that eight be, be that number, I think that has the most support in the legislature. Yeah, I think the biggest difference being that we have really no staff for us. I mean, it's a general staff that, you know, county staff, but our office, is we have one executive assistant and myself. We, you know, we don't have a lot of people ushering the educational process along. So that's why here it's a little bit different. Um, that's why, again, if we're going to go eight years, I do think the two-year cooling off is fine. But if we're going to go 12 years, I think you need to step away for four years. That was, that was the thinking on that side. So that's my thought. Okay. Um, I know Mr. Thomas wanted to say something. Did I just want, I do, I do have the latest version of the Senate bill if you wanted to, to go, uh, that, the discussion. Um, Lindsay's comment is correct. It said that um, the term limits imposed by this section of the state on the Senate bill apply to counties in which term limits are not imposed by a county charter as of July 1, 2024, um, and service of a term of office which commenced before November 5th, 2024, may not be counted towards a limitation imposed by this section. But then there were two other sections that I think might be helpful for the discussion. Next piece was the section does not supersede any term limits imposed by a county charter which is more restrictive than the term limits imposed by the section and does not authorize a person subject to such term limits to serve an additional eight consecutive years. And then there was a trigger that basically uh, required the election to take place that would coincide with a 2024 general election to determine whether the term limits imposed by that bill um, shall apply to the county. In the event the county rejects the term limits imposed, this section would not apply. So they were trying to deal with a, a variety of items, obviously, in the, in the process of legislation to incorporate a, a variety of circumstances across the state. Uh, Commissioner Lipsy Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I find myself constantly wondering how we position ourselves to fix something that doesn't appear to be broken. So my concern lends itself to what about this process that's not working currently that would have us entertain changing it? Does anyone want to respond? You don't. No response is necessary, but if you'd like to respond. Senator I'd love Sigmund. to respond. Um, uh, so I, 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 and I appreciate that, Commissioner. Um, I think that the history here in Pinellas County when it comes to term limits is, is very unique. Obviously, we know in, 20, in 1996 there was a referendum. The question was on the ballot. Uh, over 70% of um, the voters voted to uh, implement term limits here in, in Pinellas County. Obviously, there was you know, a lot of, of legal issues with that. Um, therefore, you know, 28 years later, we uh, do not have term limits uh, for the county commission. Uh, I know that there has been conversation on the commission uh, to bring back term limits. Uh, there was an effort, a grassroots effort to, to uh, get that question on the ballot that also failed, not necessarily due to a lack of support. I think it was just due to a very small window uh, to get the necessary signatures uh, I know, you know, certainly uh, I represent um, about 550,000 people here in Pinellas County. 
Um, many of my constituents, whether they're Republicans, whether they're Democrats, whether they're uh, no party affiliation, uh, they overwhelmingly support term limits. They support term limits at the federal level, which I think it's long overdue. They support term limits at the state level, uh, and they support term limits at, at the local level. And the one thing I think here in Pinellas County that we're missing is, is at the county level. And so while, while we might not have a problem per se, because at the end of the day, you can make a very valid argument uh, that the voters are the ones who should decide whether or not an individual should continue serving or not. I, and I, I take that, that argument with, with the highest respect. Uh, I think that the, you know, our founding fathers didn't uh, put term limits in, in the Constitution. I'm sure they had a really good reason for that. But time, time has changed. Uh, we're in a different, different environment, a different world. We look what's going on in, in D.C., uh, and it's, it, to me personally, I think it's somewhat disgraceful that these folks are, uh, you know, in office for 40, 50, 60 years. Uh, and, and because of the way campaign finance is in this country, it's very difficult to get some of these, these incumbents out of office. Um, so I think from, from the spirit of what I hear from, from my constituents, um, and I have concerns with, with term limits, uh, you know, serving in the legislature for eight years, um, Commissioner uh, Eggers obviously alluded to that. It takes a long time to get your arms around how to really go, do an effective job on, on behalf of, of the folks that you serve, your constituents. Um, and so it, it, eight years goes really quickly. I get that. However, I do feel that there is a significant um, opinion from, from certainly from my constituents here in Pinellas County that term limits for the county commission is 28 years overdue. Okay. Commissioner Eggers, did you have? Um, I think I was just going to lead with the residents who last had a chance to vote. And I, I don't have all the, the distinct memory of what happened, but I do believe at that time um, constitutionals were included and the Supreme Court threw it out because of the constitutional um, issue. I, I'm pretty sure, but I'm not positive. And so um, when I talked about it eight years ago, everybody got upset with me because they thought I was talking about constitutionals, and I'm not. I was talking about county commissioners. I got a lot of looks <laughs> from, from the constitutionals. And I'm not talking about constitutionals this time. It's, it, but that, I think, is what happened back then. And then there was a court case somewhere around 2010 or 11, 12, somewhere in there, that basically would have opened the door for, for that to be reheard for the county commission. Uh, even though it had been, quote, lumped together 15 years before that. So it really comes down to the, the, the citizens. If you take polls anywhere, overwhelmingly support term limits. And um, it is very difficult, unless there's a, a big issue, like, say, fluoride a few years ago, um, that you really, it's just hard to unseat an incumbent uh, because people are trying to get behind who they think is going to win, but it's also, and so they're giving money and money is just, you know, gives advertising, all that stuff. So it's just, I just think it's the right thing and it's the right time. And it is different today than it was 20 years ago, but it was heavy support then. But you go around the country right now in polls at any level, they support term limits. And it's not just a Democrat thing or a Republican thing or an independent thing. It's about 70 to 75 percent. And that's pretty significant to me. So anyway, that's all. Okay. Any other comments or uh, thoughts on this? Yes, Mr. Pachevich. Um, yeah, I'll just say I agree. Um, I'm a term limit supporter, and I agree with. Uh, I couldn't say it any better, so I'm not going to say it again. Um, I do have a comment on your on uh, the senator's proposal of, of uh, two four year. I, I'm I'm in in agreement on the eight eight years two four year terms and the two year two year cooling off period. Um, I'm not clear on how we transition from where we are now to then, and I under I I, I get that. So um, I have some concerns there. The question I have is maybe for Attorney Voses, does, do all of those details go into the, the, the ballot, uh, what's on the ballot? And, 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 and I ask that because that could create confusion and, and obviously Im impact uh, how folks vote. It, it, it's a very important point because when we're, when we're dealing with such a singular issue as term limits, and we've got that 75 words to work with in the ballot summary, there are some times where we'll have pages and pages of a charter amendment, right? All sorts of detail and we'll summarize it in 50 words. This is short and sweet. 
but each part of it is very important. So I would suggest to you that uh, there's a balancing to, to have between um, a balancing between getting it precisely the way you want it, but recognizing that if you make it too complicated, and each part of it may be so important that we need to put it in that ballot summary, any one of those pieces of it may either scare the voters or our, it's going to be our very strong goal to not confuse the voters, but to scare the voters or they might like parts of it but not other parts of it. So sometimes simplicity is the key. When it comes to the particular elements of it, that's a, a judgment call that I'd be making in the first instance in preparing it for you and then a judgment call the whole CRC would be making in you know what pieces would go in that ballot summary. But generally when it comes to such a singular issue as this, most every moving part gets put in that 75 words. And there are ways to, to summarize a lot of it really clearly and simply that don't scare off voters, but do keep that in mind if we start thinking of too many things. Commissioner Pasovich. One follow-up question on that. Is there any um, history that you've seen or that you could potentially find where other counties have done this? And did they do it maybe in two steps? In other words, they, they, they did the first step with all of the transition language and then in a subsequent uh, or would in a subsequent um, review commission change it to take out the transition uh, language, if that makes sense. It's a, a fair point. Let, let me offer a thought just generally because I've, I've heard a, a number of uh, commissioners reference transition or translation language and so on. A typical way, it's not the only way, but a typical way that you would implement term limits, uh, for example, if you were going to implement prospective term limits like you saw in uh, in the House and Senate versions, for example. You say terms starting on or after X date count towards the term limits, all right? That's really simple and doesn't take much transition. What it does have the effect of is if you had somebody, I'll just take an example, and I, I don't know when anyone on the Pinellas County Commission's terms are up, I don't have that in my head, but let's say you had a given county commissioner who had served 12 years and they were up in November and they're up for election again, this would go on. And let's say, for example, you said this goes into effect, uh, you know, with or term starting in 2024. I know the, your example, Senator, was starting in 2026, but just take my hypothetical here. Starting with term starting in 2024. Then basically with respect to counting that prospectively into the future, the analysis would be blind to how many terms that commissioner had served in the past. It would only be looking from that date forward. So that transition is easy. Getting to making it in some way or another retrospective, counting terms or years of office served prior to it going into effect is a tool you have available to you. I'm not going to tell you it's illegal under Florida law because there's no case saying that. But um, it can be a complicator to, to get into explaining that. Now, it can be as simple as, you know, starting with terms, uh, you know, for terms starting on or after November something 2020. You could set some date in the past, and that's a kind of simple way to crystallize that, all right? But again, you'll want to think through what those consequences are, and when folks see dates in the past, sometimes they might think to themselves, what else is buried in here that I'm not getting? It's just something to keep in mind. Okay, so on my list, I've got Commissioner Steck, uh, Dr. Grove, Commissioner Eggers, and then Commissioner Strickland. Uh, so let's get through those four, and then we'll keep it. Oh, you're, you're okay. I was just pointing that. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Steck, please. Thank you. Um, I, I hate to be a little slow in regard to all this, but uh, I still haven't had someone explain to me the requirement that we do this. Uh, if one would think that it would be, first of all, maybe a matter of someone uh, seeking too much power or perhaps uh, in the inability to carry out their duties. The county appears to me to be fairly well run. Uh, I'm assuming that's the case in other counties. Uh, the likelihood that any one commissioner is going to take over and run the commission uh, is it seems to be impossible. So I, I and I at the risk of boring Mr. Bose, I said this eight years ago, and I'll say it again now, 
um, we are taking the, one of the most fundamental rights we have as Americans and turning it over to a calendar at that whether uh, party affiliation has nothing to do with it. It's just plain logic to me that if someone is doing a good job, why take something away from them? And as has been pointed out, um, and whether it's true in our legislature, I know it's true, true of others, um, where there are three or four lobbyists for every legislator in a given state, uh, it used to be that legislators would uh, seek advice from lobbyists. Now it's gotten to the point that uh, they will write passages of bills for them. And, and the latest fad is the lobbyists just go ahead and write the bill and hand it over to a legislator to get it moved through through the, the legislature. And that to me is just reinforcing the fact that a lobbyist who has no term limits and is financed by a particularly well to do uh, industry or whatever uh, has more say in how a government is run than the people who vote for for folks to be office holders. Um, so I, I guess I am, at, and I, and at the risk of wasting the commission's time, if someone will explain to me why this is such a good idea to do this, it's a solution in search of a problem. I think, and and I, I, uh, again, I'm not basing this on any party affiliation or anything else. It just doesn't seem to me that it's something we need to to address at this point. Okay, I'm going to go to Dr. Grove next, and I don't think she's going to answer your question, but uh, we'll, we'll get back around in the conversation. So, Dr. Grove, and then uh, Commissioner Strickland will be after that. Um, I, I will not be able to answer that question. However, um, I do just want to clarify for you know just make sure we're all on the same page. When we say cooling off period, we are discussing um, one's ability to join a lobbying firm um, to make sure that there isn't a revolving door after serving the max amount of terms. Is that, I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page. When we talk no, about cooling so off period. When, when I say cooling off period, I mean a period of years that you would have to sit out of office that you would not be able to either be appointed to or be elected to that same office. So in okay, Clearwater, it's four years. You have to sit out a full term before you're allowed to run for mayor or for the council again. Um, and so that gotcha. that is the question of the cooling off. It doesn't have anything to do with lobbying or, you know, working for people with business before the commission. That's a separate uh, separate issue, which I, I think there's ordinances on that too, but that's not what we're talking about. Okay. I just, they, they sometimes call it cooling off. So that's why I wanted to double check. Understood. Yeah. No, thank you for um, asking. Um, yeah. yeah. Com Commissioner Strickland. Thank you. I'll make it quick. Uh, I, I should have led with I'm totally in favor of term limits at the federal and state level, um, not necessarily the local level. Um, and, and I won't belabor that point. But if it's the will of the group to go with eight or 12, then I would propose that it would be retrospective or retroactive um, because the spirit of the discussion is let's make sure those term limits are in place. So. Unfortunately, it penalizes those that are already in office, but that's the will of this group, right? If we're talking about term limits. So I don't, it shouldn't be a little asterisk by what we decide here. Oh, we'll make it effective 2026, because then those folks benefit that are currently sitting in those roles. That's all I have. Okay. Any other comments, Commissioner Jennings? Yeah, as an attorney, I should probably try not to make more work for our general counsel, but um, I, I guess I would want to see what ballot language would look like if it were simply perspective or with some retroactive component, because I'd want to understand the difference and the simplicity of what would be on the ballot. I think simplicity is key for a ballot amendment, so I'd, I'd kind of like to get an idea of what that looks like. Okay. Any other comments before I try to sum up direction? Yes. Commissioner um, Quiddy. I was just going to throw out uh, an alternative. Um, I would generally be in favor of, of 12 over, over eight, just knowing what, what um, commissioners have to do and, and that learning curve that is involved. Um, but in the spirit of the, the retroactive nature, what if you had something that was where um, newly electeds would, would have 12 years, they'd have three terms, but any sitting would get an additional eight years. So okay. they essentially get two terms. 
You understand that, Attorney Vos? So if you were a current commissioner at the time this was enacted, you'd have only two terms left. Mm -hmm. But if you were new, you'd have three. Is that, do you have any thoughts on that? I'm Thank sure God. there's not case law on that, but maybe there is. Oh, no, there's not case law on that at all. <laughs> not in Florida, at least, I can guarantee you. Uh, no, I get the idea, though. Uh, absolutely, and I can, I can play around with that idea, too. I, I think it's a fair point, by the way, again, because this is such a singularly important issue with moving parts. I think it's a fair point to see what different ballot language would look like, you know, for different scenarios and so on. Uh, so I can certainly uh, play with that. And I can play around with the idea of, of having basically, yeah, eight more years for current and then 12 years for everybody else. So I can, with the direction of the, of the commission, I can, I can fool with all of that. Okay. Commissioner Eggers? I, I, I'm just to, to, to your point, I was just trying to make, make sure how that would affect. Oh, microphone, please, sir. Sorry. Um, to your point, uh, I was just trying to see how it would affect um, the sitting commissioners, making sure that they each got, if we're, again, if we're going with three terms, and I'm not saying we're there yet, but if we go with three terms and you say it passes in November, to all sitting commissioners, they have two terms left. Um, I just want to make sure it covers everybody for three terms, and I think it does. So, um, I think the latest one, it's Brian Scott was elected in 2022 for the first time. So, in, he would he would have would it be two terms when his uh, his current term is up, or his or her term is up. So Brian's term is up in 26. Would he then get two terms from then? Well, or it could be that, that they have to at least be able to hit 12. Okay. Because he'd be too short, right? He'd end up getting a 10. Uh, no, if, if, if you're saying it's eight years from the end of his term, which would be 26, then right. he would get his three yep. terms. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So he would, be, he would be fine. I mean, if it's not eight years from this election that would cut him short and I didn't I mean I, I'm sure that's not what you meant but right I so you, yeah so you could structure it from eight years from the end of their current term okay oh, Mr. Good, Lipsy Scott thank you and does that address the partial terms that you referenced earlier it, it, uh, I think it would uh, because Commissioner Latval I believe is the only one uh, I know Commissioner Flowers is on a two-year but she'd been previously elected to a four-year and you know so she's up again in in uh, November as is Commissioner Latvala. Uh, so I believe, and we haven't gotten to this part yet either, but what's the effective date? Because I've heard 2026. I haven't really heard anybody say it's November of 2024. I have not heard anybody say that yet. Um, I think what we're looking, what I'm trying to do is when I get on the phone with Mr. Thomas and Attorney Vos, and we talk about what we're going to bring back, I'd like to have two or three drafts. I don't want six or seven or eight drafts. Um, so that's kind of where we're trying to get, if that helps. Commissioner Overend. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. The partial terms that Commissioner Flowers and Latvala are under now, I believe, would go away. Right. So they, they wouldn't happen again because now if we had term limits in Pinellas County, it would it would be under the, the list of exemptions that were in uh, in that bill. And I would just leave it to Attorney Vose's discretion as to how we get to a point where the, the clock starts in such a way that all seven commissioners aren't up at the same time. Mm -hmm. That happens obviously every year in the House and in redistricting years for the Senate. And that's that would be, I think, a really big deal and a big risk for the county. Right. Yeah, I think that the way we do it here, there's four up in 24, and there'll be three up in 26. In any way, I would be implementing term limits would not break up the staggering, okay? Because keep in, keep in mind, uh, nobody, no charter county in Florida has gotten brave enough to deviate from the four-year terms for county commissioners. Um, some arm wrestling arguments whether that's constitutional, but maybe that's why nobody's tried. But in any event, 
we have four-year terms for county commissioners uh, here in Pinellas. And um, one thing I would recommend against in the strongest terms, what you couldn't have is a charter amendment that would purport to cut off somebody's four-year term somewhere in the middle. Yeah. All right, because yeah. once they're elected, they get that four years. They have, uh, yeah. they have rights in that, in that term. But um, so we'll be good on staggering whatever, whatever comes out. Um, I had a, a, a question really quickly for the, uh, the kind of the, the variation we heard recently um, where the notes I had taken down were, were eight more years for current, uh, at most eight more years for uh, current county commissioners and for anyone else, 12 years. But then I also heard, and maybe these collapse into the same thing when you run it against the seven human beings that are in those offices right now. Um, there's another idea that uh, you said it so that the current county commissioners would have the opportunity to get a max of 12 years looking back for all time. Those potentially, based on different sets of facts, could yield different, be different. So w which one, uh, just for some feedback, which one should I give a go to, to try to implement? Well, I was just trying to make sure that we, we accounted for all the partial terms and those, yeah. those types of things and had enough runway there to, to get to I have an idea those. on that. Let me try to articulate mm -hmm. it. So I think what we're saying is term limits are not going to affect someone's current term, okay? Mm -hmm. If we say the effective date is 2026, we know that we have Commissioner Justice, Commissioner Longseat, Commissioner Latvala and Commissioner Flowers, I believe, are all on the ballot Correct. in November of 2024, which means term limits would not apply to them if it's passed at that same election and it goes into effect at 2026. So they would have a four-year term. If we were to say they only get two terms after that, that would kick in if and when they ran in 2028. Does that make sense to everyone? Or is that not what we want to do? I mean, I think that's what Attorney Vose is getting at. I'm trying to use the actual real world examples so we understand what we're talking about. So in those examples, in those examples, um, uh, Charlie's up this year. Uh, all the odd number seats are this mm -hmm, year. Mm -hmm. Even numbered seats are in two years or okay. yeah, two years from then. Um, but he has, he's got three terms by the end of this time. So if we do what you're saying, his next time up is 2028. Correct. So he would, you're, under that scenario, he's getting a fourth term and then two more four-year four terms, right? That's That would be if it took effect in 2026. If we say it takes immediate effect in 2024, then this term would count against his four years. Now, the problem theoretically becomes for Commissioner Flowers and for Commissioner Lavala, who are only on two-year terms. The reason that they're on two-year terms is because the legislature passed a bill that required charter counties to elect these seats uh, in the redistricting year, and it only applied to that one election. So that's why we have this nuance. Um, and so that would mean that if we were to enact it in 2024, and Commissioner Latvala and Commissioner Flowers are reelected in 2024, they would only get uh, they would only get eight more years, and that total for the last term would be two. In other words, the term they'd already served prior to this. Now, obviously, Commissioner Flowers had been on the commission, I think, since 2018. I had 2020. 2020. 2020, 2020, yeah, 2020. 2020. She was on the school board prior to that. Um, okay. So I'm not sure I've done anything to help Attorney Vose. Well, well, <laughs> one, thing I, one thing I can mention, one, one thing that I, just to help out in the analysis here, because uh, you all discuss things in terms of terms, and that's very common by the way, in, in discussing term limits and so on. Um, but one useful way the, the House and Senate bills were drafted, and it actually models the term limits that are in the Florida Constitution, is it puts it in terms of years, all right? Uh, years of consecutive service, all right? And the result being that uh, you don't have to worry about is two years a partial term, is it a full term or anything like that? You're counting years. And it's years, it's in terms of, are you allowed to appear on the ballot again for re-election, all right? So if you come to a situation where you've been on, say, 
your, your term limits was structured in the way that it was in the House and Senate bills, and it says uh, you can't appear on the ballot for re-election if uh, you have served or will have served but for resignation for a period of eight years, and you would serve six, a partial term and a full term, you're good. You can get on and you can serve a whole four years. You just can't do again because you've gone over eight years, you've gone 10. Mm -hmm. That's the way it's structured in, that in, in the House and Senate bill. That's the way it's structured in the Florida Constitution for the other uh, ones as well. So some of those, those things that seem like they're, they're slippery, when you work it with it in that term, it sorts out all that stuff. So it's so, just a drafting thing. For right? example, if we said you couldn't go more than 12, though, and mm -hmm. it went into effect in 2024, that would mean that it would be uh, some of those commissioners' last term. In other words, they would have been elected to their last term if they had served more than eight years prior to that. So by, by the way, let me, let me be clear of when, when, when we say effective a certain date. Uh, let, me, let me suggest changing the, the terminology a little bit, all right? And I'm going to use a long phrase just to make it really clear. When do we start counting the number of years? Mm -hmm. All right? Because typically when you, say, when you say effective for the such and such elected, all right, and future elections, and it, that's not the exact way you write it in the ballot summary, but when you're talking about that, you're talking about you're going to start counting years or counting terms from that date. All right. So, for example, to make term limits effective in the regime I'm talking about here, applicable to county commissioners who've been serving, you would say can't serve more than X years, and you start counting those years in 2016, November 2016, or, or whatever it is. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm, I'm getting back to, I think, what Commissioner Pasovich was saying, which is, I don't want to overcomplicate this so much Completely. that the ballot question, the voters look at it and say, what the heck is, you know, what does this mean? Like, you know, if we said, because some of the commissioners have been on there since 2010, I think, is 12. that the old, 12, 12 is the oldest? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if, you know, theoretically, if we were to give them another two, two terms, that would be 24 years or uh, roughly. So I don't want to give the impression to the voters that we're having a term limit, but it's going to be 24 years total. So, I mean, what, what I would like to focus on is if we do term limits, when do they start, okay, and how many terms are the term limits going to be, and if we're going to set a different standard for the current commissioners than from new commissioners. Th those seem to be the issues that we're circling. Um, and so I guess, first off, I know that Commissioner Strickland said he would like it to be retroactive. I'm hearing from pretty much everybody else they want it to be perspective that's made an opinion on that. Is there anybody else that would make it retroactive, in other words, that it applies to the years that the, commis the current commissioners have already served? Anybody else? Okay, so I think that respectfully is done. Or Commissioner Pasovich, yeah. No, I, th I think I would be in support of some, f some amount of retroactive uh, years counting toward the term limit. Okay. Years or, or terms. Okay. I would as well. All right, so but that, does that go then to a different standard for the current commissioners for how many more terms they can serve as opposed to saying all of the years that you've served in the past count against the term limit? I think what Commissioner Strickland, please go ahead and explain what you're suggesting, because I don't want to put words in your mouth. So you're, you're fine. In the spirit of the discussion, in initially was about term limits. And forgive me, but I think Charlie Justice will. He he started in 2012. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, sir. So theoretically, he could end up serving 24 years under one of the discussion items we discussed. That goes against the very nature of the discussion. I think Attorney Vos said it perfectly when you said it's number of years served. So that could have been 12 years ago, or that could have been two years ago. Your clock started. I think that's the best way to handle this. Is there any other, anyone else who would like to limit the, or include the prior years of service as a retroactive um, counting towards the current what we what we're suggesting would be the term limit. Yeah, yes, I mean, I have, Jennings, I'm a mixed bag. If it's, if it's Senator DeSegley's proposal where it's eight years in his perspective, I, I don't support the retroactiveness. 
um, on the eight-year term, but if it's a 12-year term, I would support it to some degree. To some degree. Okay, Commissioner Lipsy scott I don't support the retroactive. But getting back to your point that you made earlier with regards to get stepping away from terms and looking at years, how would that impact the ability to keep them staggered? Doesn't have any impact at all on it. And, and here's why. Because it's all in reference to whether or not you can appear on the ballot for re-election. All right. And th this, is, this is kind of the key trigger piece, right? You cross, it, you cross over that line of X years, whatever it is, eight years, 12 years, what have you. After that point, you remain in office for the rest of your term. But then when it comes time for re-election, um, you cannot stand for re-election. And as you're aware, the term re-elect has a very clear meaning under the Florida Election Code. You, know, you can't run for it. And then the, um, the House and Senate bills, just as an example, fleshed it out further to make sure that you couldn't even hop over to another seat, uh, which technically would not be a re-election under the Florida Election Code, but gave that two-year cooling off period. In any event, um, yeah, no, it's, it's set up in terms of standing for election. It does not, in any event, in any structure of term limits that I would recommend to you or that I have seen in Florida, it uh, doesn't cut off terms in the middle. It just regulates whether or not you can appear on the ballot again. Okay, and what would be the situation if someone vacated the seat and they're only serving a partial term? A new individual coming in, they're only serving a partial term. Then you will find this overlap again with regards to them running and having a full term and having served a partial term. How do you get to... And, and that, that that's the matter there of, of say, for example, uh, yeah, let me, let me walk you through a hypothetical, all right? Say uh, somebody is a county commissioner and they resign just before, resign and say, uh, they, they, resi they resign in, in April, a year and a half into their term because they're going to go up to Tallahassee for something or what have you. They're, they're out of there. And um, let's forget about governor's appointments or anything like that. Let's say somebody f runs to fill the rest of the two-year, for the two years left, right? They get elected. They're in their two years. They run for re-election. Uh, and then they're in for a four-year term. Now at the end of that, they will have served six years under the House and Senate language, just as an example, and under what I would bring back to you, at least in my initial thinking of the draft, that person would be allowed to run again because they will have not served eight years. They will have served six. So they'd be up again. So when you say eight, and for the lawyers in the room, you know this happens. You say one number and you game it out, it ends up meaning another number or it can in when you have unique factual scenarios, you can end up in unique situations where it might end up being nine or it might end up being 10. Uh, but that is what it is. That's, that's, so that's finished, how everything in election law plays out. Yeah, they just couldn't run again. Once they've hit that 10th number in the middle of the term, they'd be done at that So time. the way to right. think about they, it. They would, yeah, they would remain, they would remain in their term, right. but be ineligible to run again. again. So yeah. the way to think about it is how many years they'd served prior to seeking re-election. So if they'd served seven years or less, they'd be able to run for re-election. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, uh, it would be phrased that way in the ballot summary as well. Okay, so it, it would be in reference. It would be in reference to eligibility to run again, which again is is what uh, what you had with respect to uh, the House and Senate bills, just as an example. And on that, is there a, is the, Mr. Chair? Right, please. Is there um, is there a state statute that says if, if in a four year term that if it's less than it's a government governor appointee, and if it's more than it's an election? It's the Florida Constitution. Okay. All yeah. right. Thank you. So, so, it, so it's pretty clear that it, it, under two years, a governor makes an appointment. Over two years, there's a, you run for office. There's a, a, an election. That, that's correct. Yeah, that's, that's laid out in the Florida Constitution with respect to county officers, which includes county commissioners, even in charter counties. So it sounds like the best legal advice is instead of talking about number of terms, it's talking about 
number of years served prior to standing for reelection. Um, so then that begets the question of how many years do you want to make that? And how does it apply to terms or years that have already been served uh, for the current commissioners? And I don't know if we're going to, I mean, we're not going to make a decision tonight, of course. But what, again, as, as I said, trying to get like two or three options to come back to you with. I've heard eight years. I've heard 12 years. I've heard from for folks that are currently on the commission that they would only be able to serve eight more years as opposed to people that were newly elected that would be able to serve 12 years. I've heard other folks say that it should apply to all the years that they've already served. Um, so in, in terms of trying to narrow this down for our experts here to come back with something, um, anybody want to chime in? I mean, I, I, it's hard to take a roll call, you know, a, a guess the temperature on some of those things. Yeah, I, I think Todd, uh, Commissioner Jennings talked about that because I mean, if, if you're talking 12 years, I think you almost have to make it like January 1st of 2024 so that that term, those years to that point count. That's a retroactive to me. If you're going to go eight years, it's a little different story. I think you don't want to, I mean, my term is up in 2026. I mean, I don't think that that means I should be eligible for two more terms at that point. So now we're talking, I could get up to eight, five terms. And that, I don't think that's the spirit of what we're talking about. Um, I mean, I, I'm not even sure an extra term in my case because I'd be, I have two years after the election and the determination of term limits. I'll hit, I'll hit my three terms in two years. So, th so that goes to when it's effective really too um, also, yeah, uh, it whether does. it's effective in 20, at this election or whether it's effective at the next election in 26. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Steck, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand up there. Go, uh, please go ahead. No problem. Um, in the in the discussion so far, I know there was originally a discussion about uh, cooling off periods and running again for another another office. Is that is not in the discussion we're having tonight? I guess am I correct in that? I think it's still a part of it. We just haven't focused on it as much as some of the other issues. Okay. Uh, All right. I th I feel like a lot of folks I heard that mentioned that said the two years would be. Sufficient. Yeah, Commissioner Jennings. I, 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 if it's this, the proposal of Senator DeSegley, then I think two years is sufficient. If it's the proposal of uh, Commissioner Twitty, then I would agree with four years as a cooling off period. So, in other words, if it was 12 year, if it was a 12 year term, Commissioner Jennings is saying it should be a four year cooling off period. If it's an eight year term, it should be a two year cooling off period. And Commissioner Eggers agrees. Okay. Attorney Vose. Dangerous question. Do you have enough uh, of our insight to come back with uh, some options for us? Uh, I, I can see at least three. Frankly, I'm, I think I may see four in here. Uh, I agree that I wouldn't recommend you having a multiplicity of, of six or seven or anything like this. Of course, when we put together the structure of any of these, once we have the structure to embody these different ideas, it's easy to change out some sure. of the numbers, right? You know, you got you got some of the the structure built in on on your uh, number of years and on your cooling off period and all that stuff. You can change those things. You can even change dates. So, uh, I I think I've discerned at least three, maybe four different options to put together, uh, put together some some language. And I'm this is one of those instances where I think the ballot summary is as or more important than the actual charter language. The charter language is easy. You just write it down in complete sentences. It's the ballot summary that's going to be very interesting for this. Yes, that's, that's exactly. I'll, I'll probably just go ahead and do the charter language too, but, uh, but uh, the ballot summaries is what I'll be bringing back as the primary tool for you all to consider. Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, Commissioner Butler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, are we agreeing on talking about years served instead of terms, or is that kind of part of what Attorney Vose has? I think that's what Attorney Vose has recommended as probably the clearest. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody else is good with that. And, and I don't think anybody's disagreed okay. with that. So. It's, uh, I will tell you, it's my general rec recommendation for a couple reasons. 
Uh, I think it's useful to have it, I think I would speculate here, but given the interest at the legislature that they've, uh, you know, they've looked at this for a number of years, I would speculate we're going to see a similar regime come back and that they're not going to go rewrite it from scratch. And so doing it that way makes sense. There's also a lot of benefit in, in doing it that way because it is consistent with the way it's done in the Florida Constitution. It makes it very easy to analyze. When you look at a lot of other charter counties, not all of them, but they do do it in terms and ways you see uh, that in reference to terms, then they have to get down to the weeds and talk about what counts as a partial term, what's this, what's that. It actually avoids a lot of problems doing it the way the Florida Constitution does it. And I agree. I just, it was a point of clarity. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Other comments, uh, thoughts for this topic before we move on for tonight? Anybody else? Okay. Um, so, let's see, I lost my agenda here. Here we are. Okay, old business, uh, revised draft ballot and charter language, charter amendment revising thresholds for appointment and removal of county attorney. Chairman, I'll handle this. This is, uh, as we say, third verse, same as the first. Um, after your discussion, uh, at your last meeting, and again, don't necessarily need any action on this tonight. Just wanted to bring this back to you uh, so you had it in front of you if, in case there was any further discussion. And I'm getting to my memo here. Uh, at your last meeting, you discussed uh, two further elaborations on the uh, potential charter amendment concerning the hiring and removing of the county attorney. Uh, those two options that you considered at your February 26 meeting were one that increased the supermajority requirements, basically uh, nine out of 12 to hire or to remove at a single meeting um, the county attorney, uh, but maintain the threshold to remove at two consecutive meetings at a simple majority of seven to 12. The other one had a, uh, a scheme that involved uh, for uh, hiring or removing both a, a 8 of 12 supermajority uh, and a majority of the, both the county commissioners and the constitutional officers to support that decision. The general direction that I gathered from that discussion was uh, the 75% supermajority was potentially too high and the complicating factor of having the um, having to have a majority of both the county commissioners and the constitutional officers seemed a little too complicated. So before you in this memo is back to the version that was before you in the first version, which was uh, one that tracks and mirrors what you find for the appointment and removal for the county administrator, just mathematically adjusted to account for the fact that it's the county attorney oversight com uh, committee uh, doing it. Okay. Uh, comments on the proposed ballot language um, on the county attorney hiring and termination process? We're not voting on it tonight. Just want to, you know, make sure that we're zeroing in on where we might land. So if you have a significant issue with it, it might be a good time to mention that. But uh, if we're generally okay with it, I think. And it's seven in consecutive meetings. Where I think right. everybody, yeah, obviously that's the case. Okay. Right. Okay. Is there any other comments or thoughts on that one? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Steck, I'm sorry. I saw I missed you. That's okay. I hope to be back next time. <laughs> but um, <laughs> anyway, um, my only concern in regard to this is theoretically uh, one, of the, one of the folks could be removed totally without any recompense to the to the idea that uh, the people he serves uh, voted to remove him. In other words, as complicated as it is to have that majority of the uh, constitutional officers uh, as well as majority of the commission, uh, that still would seem to be more appropriate to me. Okay. Any other comments on the county attorney process? 
All right. Uh, next item is other business updates from Mr. Thomas and uh, Mr. Bose. Um, I can take a start at that. Um, in front of you this evening is kind of an update. I thought it'd be helpful to get a sense of the various topics. You may remember last year we did a kind of a straw poll vote of the topics you wanted and those that had seven or more interests to proceed. Uh, we've redeveloped on this list. <clears throat> and as Wade and I and, and Brian have worked through the, your agendas, I've identified where topics have come before you either in one first draft, second draft, or in today's third draft, or when we've at least addressed those items. And what you'll see through this point is there's really two items yet that we have not at least initially brought back for your consideration. Uh, one of those has to do with the elected county administrator or slash county executive topic. We want to chat a little bit about where we are in that process. And the other item um, that uh, we want to at least provide some verbal components to is this discussion of um, classified employees. I know that uh, the Commissioner and I have gone back and forth on this, and I know in working with your legal counsel and trying to work with the county attorney, it's taken a little while to address that. Uh, we, we do have a verbal update. Wade's going to be able to provide at least a snapshot of that, but we thought it'd be helpful to at least provide that as a verbal update to you tonight because that may have some bearing depending upon where the CRC goes with regards to a county executive and appointing and removing authority. So uh, we're going to be able to kind of address that. That's taken a little bit longer than we all thought it would to, to run that item down, but we'll be able to take that in, in play. Um, and then the only other one that, that is, uh, was kind of a blanket statement that we've yet to really kind of address is, is under the possible new items on the second page, which dealt with any emerging issues or what other counties may be uh, considering or adding to their charter. So we've tried to keep a, a snapshot of that and what's going on. Certainly, um, the general counsel is involved in a couple other counties and charter review commissions. Uh, but I don't think we really have anything that's evolving. I know we've talked about that in the past, that those tend to be generally generated by the unique nature of each county. So we don't think we're going to have anything to come back to you at that point. Um, and ultimately what we want to do is start to land the plane. Uh, we've got to start, we've, we're trying to get a variety of background information to all of you, and then our, our sense would be as after we've kind of flushed out the initial topics for everything, we're going to need to then start bringing you back to making some consistent decisions about where you want to land so we can start developing appropriate language, start to develop the report, and then also obviously schedule the various public hearings that need to take place. So. Uh, you've been making pretty good progress. I know we've been working our way through this issue, but we want to just give you a snapshot and give you kind of a cheat sheet if you need to go back to look at a particular memo or an issue as we start to, to bring the plane down onto the ground as well. So um, with that, um, Wade, do you want to talk a little bit about the classified employee position? Absolutely. And then we can tee up the, uh, the last conversation. Sure. Um, and uh, commissioners, just, just to recall, this was really just a question, and it made it on our list because it's a question that arose as we were uh, going through our our section by section review of the entire charter. And there was a reference reference in two sections of um, section uh, 4.01 made a reference to unclassified positions. All right, and this was a term that that. I was not particularly comfortable to tell you off the top of my head precisely what I thought it might mean. I had some ideas, but went digging, and uh, quite frankly, it took a lot more legal, archeo legal archeology span than I thought it would to uh, figure out what it means. And part of it is because, uh, just to, to jump to the conclusion a little bit, I think as a practical matter, the matter has been sorted out within the county administration and with the county commissioners for so long, everybody had forgotten that it had gotten sorted out. So uh, I will just wanted to very briefly tell you verbally how it's been resolved and how it's gone along at least for the last 23 years. So um, uh, there is that provision in the charter, as I mentioned. It basically reads with regard to those two provision provisions. Uh, with respect to the county administrator and, and the county administrator's authority, employment of persons in unclassified positions shall be subject to confirmation by the Board of County Commissioners. And then uh, similarly, termination of persons in unclassified positions shall be subject to confirmation by the Board of County Commissioners. When asked 
everyone in the county administration said, we don't do anything like that. Um, well, after a lot of digging and, and folks remembering, um, uh, hearing tell from folks way back when and so on, it was uh, tracked down that back in 2001, there was a resolution of the Board of County Commissioners where uh, this matter of unclassified positions, and that term wasn't even defined in the resolution. I do have some other hints as to what it might uh, reference. But in 2001, the Board of County Commissioners passed a resolution that delegated the Board of County Commissioners authority to confirmation of unclassified employees to the county administrator. So basically said, Board of, Board of County Commissioners said, County administrator has this power, we don't need to, to deal with it anymore, and so on. And the county has operated under that regime since that time. Now, I will tell you, there were two instances in 2004 and in 2006 when the Pinellas County Charter Review Commission put a uh, charter amendment on the ballot to change that provision. Now, mind you, I know I said 2004 and 2006, but that was the same Charter Review Commission. Uh, to remember your Charter Review Commission history. This is the one in 2004 that did a lot of stuff, decided they didn't have enough time, put it on the ballot to extend their terms, and it passed, and so they continued on through 2006. They put on twice to, um, to remove that provision and effectively, effectively accomplish what this resolution accomplished in 2001 to say the Board of County Commissioners doesn't need to be involved in those things. In each instance, and I will note, in each instance they paired another power for the county or the, for the county administrator along with it. So I don't know what the voters were really responding to there, but in both instances the voters voted it down by tremendous margins. The voters voted it down by it was 60 some odd percent or 58 percent each time. Reading the ballot summaries, it could lead a layperson to think that a whole lot more power was being vested in the county administrator. So I could understand trying to read it from that perspective. Um, going on further in my legal archaeology, I came across a, uh, a PowerPoint from the then county attorney in 2011 that addressed this issue. There's a further legal complication. While the the Charter Review Commission final reports proceeded on the assumption and it stated that unclassified meant exempt. Um, that conclusion is not completely the case, uh, or at least not completely understood that that absolutely is the case. In any event, the county operates with regard to its employment of its employees under what's called the Unified Personnel Act. All right. This is a special act that is referenced uh, in the charter. And to, to further complicate things, the charter expressly says that it is not supposed to modify anything in the Unified Personnel Act. Well, the Unified Personnel Act specifically says, effectively, that the county administrator has the power to hire and fire anyone under their authority without any sort of requirement for confirmation. So in any event, the undertone I get from, from this is basically the thought that that charter provision conflicts with that other special act in any event. And frankly, the resolution that was done in 2001, as a practical matter, solved the problem. So this is a little sticky wicket in all of this here. When the Charter Review Commission had tried to sort it out uh, by another means, by putting it on the ballot, it got shot down. I would offer to you all, and it's of course the, the CRC's discretion, it may or may not be something to co completely interest the CRC in, in sparing another ballot question to give another go at it. One final thing I would mention concerning this matter is if there is going to be substantial reform concerning the county executive, particularly uh, moving to an elected county executive form, uh, that whole portion of the charter would likely get completely rewritten, and that whole piece would likely come out in the wash in rewriting of any of that. So just a thought that if you were going to have the reform of, of a whole bunch of things concerning the executive power within the county government, that would be just one little piece that probably wouldn't even be mentioned in a ballot summary. 
So just want to give you all that, that verbal update from what I was finally able to piece together and see if there was any interest in digging into anything further concerning it. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for your digging. Uh, I just say let's leave it alone then. Sorry. There was one other item that came up. I believe it was Commissioner uh, Anne Marie Brooks, um, who's not here tonight, who brought it up at the last meeting, if I'm recalling correctly. But it was the issue about having a charter officer whose role it is is to basically be the county commissioner's designee on preparing and presenting the budget. And the thought process, uh, my recollection is that. Uh, now, the budget process is with the staff who's under the county administrator, and the general thought was uh, maybe the commissioners should be the persons who, who appoint or hire their budget director. I, and I'm, she's not here, so I don't want to put words in her mouth, um, but I believe I'd heard that also from some other uh, folks who had talked to me about it, that they were interested in that. Is there any other interest in that? Is anybody else interested in that topic to, to consider going forward, or is there not interest in that? Not hearing any interest in that. That doesn't necessarily mean not interest, but I'm assuming your silence speaks that it's not interested in that. Okay, so we will take that off the list for now. Uh, okay. Um, Chairman, on yes. a different subject, I did have one additional update. Um, from your discussion at your last meeting with your supervisor of elections, um, I've gone ahead and prepared uh, charter amendment language uh, doing some um, uh, revisions to the initiative petition process uh, along the lines of what that discussion, uh, how that discussion went. I have circulated it to the county attorney's office and to the supervisor of elections office before uh, sharing out the final version with, uh, uh, with the CRC just to get feedback to see whether or not anything I put down in there I misunderstood or it fundamentally you know, breaks something in their process in their office. Wanted to get that feedback first, and uh, once I have that feedback, I'll be sharing that out uh, to all the CRC uh, commissioners, and you'll have that before you at a future meeting. Okay, very good. Um, I know we have <laughs> had a, a really roller coaster schedule on canceling meetings, rescheduling meetings. Thank you all for being here. Um, and for those who are online, thank you for, for um, attending and making sure we have a quorum and making sure we're, we're keeping moving in the right direction. I typically don't like to get into scheduling in meetings like this because, you know, I don't want you all have to get your phones out and then figure out all that stuff. But we may, I think we want to take a few minutes to talk about it and see if we can land on something that makes sense uh, going forward so that we all have a regular schedule. and the public will know when we're meeting and not have meetings canceled and re-noticed and all that kind of stuff. So, attorney, oh yes, Commissioner Eggers. On, on that, you, that microphone. You, oh, yeah, thank you. So he doesn't tell, tell me again, so that he does that all the time, telling <laughs> me. Um, if we could get some sense of, again, I, I got some something today in an email saying that July 24th is being reserved as the commission doing their ministerial duties uh, to approve whatever we come up with. So is there a timeline, like we're gonna have the two public hearings in June, and then we have to get all of our work done in at the, by the end of May? So we're talking maybe four more meetings, or is that, just trying to get a sense of what you're thinking. So, so coming up with the, the final public hearing schedule to, to accommodate those last pieces to bring in the plane for a landing, is actually probably the immediate next step after, uh, as the chairman alluded to, sorting out what what meeting availability meeting availability looks like generally through all of this. Because with that in place, we'll have that to be able to to build back that schedule. But yes, you're you're correct. We are looking at you know potentially as few as four or five more meetings uh, before having public hearings. Okay. But uh, we, we want to get to sense. building yeah. okay. that. Thank and, you. 
Um, Chairman, I were you throwing it over to me to, yeah, to I know reference? Yeah, you said you, you had a suggestion. So just to clarify, we've got April 4th set, which is a Thursday. We've got April 17th set, which is a Wednesday. And we have May 1st set, which is a Wednesday. And we have May 15th set, which is also a Wednesday. Um, those are the ones that are in italics. Um, Attorney Bose, you had an issue with Wednesdays. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, commissioners, um, uh, my schedule has gone from having first and third Wednesdays always free to my first and third Wednesdays until I know better are tied up on the complete opposite side of the state. So, um, so what had been good has been completely broken and I'm very sorry for that. But uh, what I was going to propose is the cycle we're on right now with this meeting and that April 4th <coughs> meeting, um, if we could potentially shift to first and third Thursdays instead of first and third Wednesdays. And I, I just to... did a quick look at my calendar and that, that works for me. Um, I'll give you all some time here. Uh, if, if what I'd like to hear is if that's a big problem for anybody or it's not, not gonna work. Yes, Commissioner Lipsy Scott. On the 18th of April, of April. Okay, but the other, the 4th and the 2nd and the 16th work for you okay? We're talking about May 2nd and 16th. Uh huh. Yeah, we'd be moving the May 1st to the 2nd and May 15th to the 16th would be the effect of that. You're okay on that one? Okay. It depends on the Thursday, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I've juggled my calendars with the other clients that I've got, so uh, I hate to be the sticking point on that, but I'll, I'll see what we can do. The four Thursdays generally work better for me, but once again, I know this is a challenge to do this in a yeah. meeting like this. So we're, and then we're talking April 18th and... Uh, no, it would be April 4th and April 17th. They're both Thursdays, as, as far as I can tell, April right? 17th is oh, a, oh, yeah, it's it's 18th. A, is so, a Wednesday. So, so it would go April 18th, May 2nd, May 16th. You okay, Mike? Uh, You're out on just that one meeting. Okay. I'm out on April 4th. Okay. Mr. Chairman, yes. I have a problem with uh, May 16th. Okay. Other than that, I'm good. I'm not hearing anybody say they can't make any of the meetings. I'm hearing several people say that there's one, one meeting that they might not be able to attend. And what I'm going to promise you guys is what we talked about at the beginning is we're not going to finalize this stuff until like one final meeting that everyone's going to know when that meeting is. And my thought is it would be in early June um, and, and make sure that everybody's, you know, everybody can be there that wants to be there. Uh, I'm out of the country from June 14th to the 26th. So I'd like, this is, would like to get this all wrapped up before that. So, yes. Will there be a meeting on April 17th or the 18th? Sounds like what we're talking about is going April 4th, April 17th, May 18th, 2nd, 18th. 18th, I'm sorry, April 18th, May 2nd, and May 16th. But what I would say is look for an email from Mr. Thomas uh, uh, confirming that. Because um, th I'm sure there'll be some, we need to make sure the room is available and you know do all, all of those maneuvers as well. And if Mr. Thomas isn't available for a couple of those, we'll, we'll need to talk about that too. If we're, if we're talking about two public hearings and we do them in June, you're almost talking like June 6th and June 13th. You said you're out June 14th. I think it's June 13th. I have to look at my calendar again. Oh, okay. Well, those are the Thursdays again, mm -hmm. and it's two meetings in June so that we still have those four meetings to do work. Right. I mean, that's... that's. I, mean, I think we're getting pretty close. I mean, I know the, count, the term limits is a big deal and the county administrator uh, is a big deal and th those are both complicated, but I think between the next four meetings, we should be able to get through most of that, I would think. And I don't think we really have anything else to... Pressing. I think the supervisor of elections, we'll have to look at that language. You've already worked on that and you've already provided it to the supervisor and her staff. And then the, um, the county attorney uh, hiring and termination process, but I think we're pretty close to done on that, so. So uh, you, you mentioned the county administrator. Um, we really haven't really talked to get a sense of what the feeling is around this table, have we? 
I think we room. did vote on priorities at the beginning, and that was one of the priorities that people wanted to talk about. Okay. Uh, Talked my, about. But yeah, yeah, yeah. My plan is to invite um, the county administrator to present to us before we dive into that topic. And so obviously confirming which, if any of these dates work for him uh, and his team is important as well. So that that's all, you know, homework for me and Mr. Thomas and Mr. Vose. I'm scheduled to meet with the, the uh, county administrator tomorrow afternoon, so I was gonna check on that date once yeah, we- like, we'll like for him to have as much time to present to us on that before we delve into it uh, as possible, so. So if I could just verify, just so I'm clear on the date. So we're, we're good on April 4, is that what yes, I'm hearing? Sir. The April 17th meeting, you're looking to move to the 18th, I think I heard, correct? That's right. And then the May 15th meeting, you're looking to, I, it was unclear to me what we're May doing. May 1st would go to May 2nd, and May 15th would go to May 16th. It would go to the 16th. So, after, so starting in May, looking at the 1st and 3rd. Correct. Thursdays, okay. All right. I apologize, I'll do one more. Appreciate everybody's patience. I'll That's get okay. one more mass email out to you all and it, we'll it figure out where it all shakes month. out. And we'll also, yeah. obviously we need to check on because Thursdays have not been, uh, other than these dates have not been verified for this room. So we'll have to check on that first. Okay. Okay. Anything else uh, anyone wants to talk about? Anything else for the good of the order before we stand adjourned? All right, we're adjourned. Thank you.